know what I want to say to you? That if I had to choose between any of the hosts, this guy dresses most like Robert Osborne. Well, you know, I'm sure you all know we have an amazing stylist. She's actually right. She's right there. She's Holly had a Holly. She dresses. She's standing next to Eddie. She has that cool. She's right there. She dresses all five of us, and she. We all have different styles, and she gets to really have fun with all of it. So that's right. I love it. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Are you kidding me? I, I live for this. And we're seeing a lot of you on TCM lately, right? Well, you know, I worm my way into that company. If I handled my career the way I handled getting into the TCM family, I'd be a superstar. But instead, I just climb my way to the middle and I stay there. But I'm so happy. I love this place. I love TCM. I love being here. It's my life. I have it on 24-7. History of Hollywood and films. Yeah. Yeah. Just watch movies and enjoy life for five years. That would be my wish. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. Laura, is it? Uh, did you, do you feel now uh, that becoming an actor was inevitable, or, or did you? really feel like you could have gone in a different direction. Uh, and for those who don't know, uh, Laura's, Laura's father, uh, uh, Bruce Stern, uh, also a uh, actor. Uh, he was here at our, our festival last year. Uh, so uh, did you feel like this was an effort? Do you feel now that it was an effort? Well, I do uh, think it was inevitable based on the experiences that I was so blessed to have. Um, I, in sharing many conversations with my mother in making the book which Ben mentioned to you. Uh, I learned so many stories about mom's journey to becoming an actress as a teenage girl in a small town in Mississippi. And when I hear her stories, I wonder if I'd been a child not with actor parents, not growing up literally here in the middle of Hollywood, California, I don't know would I have found it as my dream in the way it did. Would you have had my courage like Joan of Arc? I doubt it. <laughs> like $25 in her pocket and a little cardboard suitcase taking the train to New Orleans and then New York City by yourself at 16? That's kind of a true story. I, I, I don't know that I would have had that courage. Um, I think I would have fallen in love with storytelling um, regardless. And she kind of got there on her own at 14, 15, was in a little movie called Foxes. And the director called me, or she auditioned against a girl 21 years old for the part. The girl was supposed to be 17. And she auditioned for the man. The agent took her. I was like, go on your own, get rejected, find out what it's like. And so I just <laughs> be over. And my God, the next thing I knew, they were testing her. And she didn't get it, but. He gave her, he loved her so much, he gave her a little part in the movie. And then he called me up to come see the scene. He said, I don't want you to see this. And I thought, oh boy, what? So I go to MGM and he shows me the movie. And the minute I saw Laura on screen, oops, I got my car. That's what happened to my heart. That's exactly what happened. It was God's okay. So I thought, oh my God. 
She's got it. She has the gift. And whatever your children have a gift, I don't care if it's baking bread or growing roses, anything your child, which is part of you, has a gift. The minute you know they got a gift, I don't care if you have to go on scrub floors or what you have to do, pay for the lessons, help them, they are you. Let your children stand on your shoulders so maybe they will see further than you have in life. Do it for your kids. But then, when she, then I said, okay, you want to be an actor? Okay. Well, then you're going to have to study. And she was very young. I said, look, there's a little school over here, Harvard School for Boys, has a class on, on the weekend for boys and girls and drama class. I said, if you, if you want to, you, you have to give up your playtime on Saturday. And I said, you have to get yourself there on your own bicycle. And you have to get up Saturday morning and make your own lunch. I'm not, I'm not catering to you. If you want to learn discipline, if you're going to do this, you're going to do it right. Oh, she got up every morning. She made that lunch. She got on that bicycle. And she did it. She did it. She always did it. They're here, there, and they're there for months and months at a time, a year maybe sometime. We made those films in 15 days. That's amazing. We would shoot, I don't know how many scenes we would do, 30 setups, 40 setups in a day. You know, you say, I, I would say to Bill Astor, who was the director, you know, Bill, maybe Frankie should say this. He said, come on, just go have some fun. Come on, let's do it. Come on. Next setup. And that's how we made those films. Wow. We were really a group of friends. Everybody from all the pictures that we made, seven or ten, like you said, uh, everybody was in the same picture. We were all doing the same thing, so it was fun. It was really fun. Do you remember first meeting Annette Funicello? You're yeah, I do. Together. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was not on the beach. It was close by where we are right here in Hollywood. It was at the Hollywood Bowl, and uh, we were doing a show. She was very popular with the Mickey Mouse Club. And um, I was very hot with a lot of music at the time. And we were at the Hollywood Bowl. And Dick Clark presented the show. And I met her. Of course, she was the cutest thing. I must have been about uh, maybe about 19, 18 or 19 years old. She's a couple, three years younger than me. And I got to talk to her. I thought she was really cute. So I said, could I have your phone number? I'd like to take it to get some pizza or something. She said, you've got to talk to my mother. <laughs> so I did. I talked to her mother, Virginia, and I said, would you mind if I call and maybe pick her up to go have a slice of pizza? And she said, that'd be fine. So I went over to the house, I met Joe, her father, and uh, uh, Virginia, and we talked for a while, and there was a place right up the street there, and we went and had a slice of pizza and talked, and uh, we talked on the phone for a while, and that was about it. And then all of a sudden, I got the phone call uh, that we were going to do this picture at Beach Party. And uh, I said, who's playing opposite? She said, that they said, uh, Annette Funicello. I said, oh, I like her a lot. She, she's great. And we did our first scene together. It just happened. I just liked her a lot. She liked me a lot. We were friends. And we became such friends that I am godfather to her daughter. Uh, and she, her husband is godfather to my oldest son. So we had dinners together, uh, so we came not just on screen, we really became friends.
introduced me to Fred Roos. The casting director. Yeah, the casting director. Gino Haven, so I guess, was his assistant, George's assistant. But, uh, yeah, Jack Nicholson, I met him at a party, actually. Of course. <laughs> Introduced me to Fred Roos, who is uh, cast The Godfather, cast American Graffiti, uh, I mean, just countless films. And uh, that's how I got in to try out for the part. And it was a sought after part. I think Sydney Williams has said she really wanted to. Yeah, she wanted my part. But she couldn't have it. <laughs> my part. Now, Richard, I've heard alternately that you were given the choice to play Kurt, your part, or the Ron Howard part. But then I also read that you were given the choice to play Kurt or Terry the Toad. I think that's I think that's the true one. Yeah. Right. I was I was George gave me a choice to either play Charlie Martin Smith's part or Kurt. And I chose Kurt. And he said, why? And I said that it was because he was self-aware. And I I really enjoyed playing that. Had you read the book, Paint Place, before you got the role? 
No, I didn't, but I, I heard a lot about it. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the character, Norman Page, was, uh, in the book, everything was uh, like, in fact, they said the movie is washed down a lot. It's just not like the book, which was not like the movie. It's washed down, but, it's, but in the book, it was like, it was like really heavy duty, uh, uh, and it was almost banned. Uh, and, and the uh, writer, Grace Metallius, was just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how she ever got through a book. She used to lock her kids out of the house so she could write. <laughs> really, really far out. Yeah, I heard it's the kind of book you had to read under the covers, <laughs> with a flashlight, yeah. when, you, when you were reading. And when it came to Diane Barsi, who you share a lot of scenes with, you were telling me backstage that you actually had a hand in her casting. Yes, I did. I, um, when I got the part of Norman Page, um, Mark Wilson, the director, uh, asked me if I would read with some of the, uh, uh, with some actresses to see, uh, uh, to see which one would be the best to play Allison, the, the, the lead girl in it. And uh, I, I read with a lot of actresses. Uh, even Terry Moore, who's in the movie, read for, for this part. And several other actresses, too. Uh, they all read for it. And they all came in with their portfolios and pictures and, uh, and, and, and resumes of all the things that they had done. And then finally, this girl came in. And uh, she came in. And we were in Mark and I were sitting there. And, and uh, so I. I and so he asked her, he said, what, uh, what have you done so far? And she said, nothing. And, oh, nothing. She says, well, what did you think of the book? And she said, oh, I haven't read it. And he said, oh, well, do you want to, do you want to do this movie? And, and she said, I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> and Mark and I looked at each other and thought, well, this girl is really weird. Well, what do you do? She says, I write poetry. And... But by the time she finished, Mark, when she left, Mark and I said, that's the girl. That's the one. That's the one that should play this part. So that's how she got it. And she does such a good job in the film, but she left Hollywood soon after. Yeah, I think she, she left Hollywood. She was very, very young, Hollywoodish, and hated the glamour and hated the spotlight. And uh, that was it. I think she came back and made one movie after that, a couple of two or three years later. Then she went back east and uh, went to college. about Jaime Escalante and the script of Stand and Deliver. How did you get involved? The uh, actual story itself, I, I read about it in the newspaper when it hit and, uh, back in 1983 uh, when the whole country heard about it. And the kids passed the test and everybody, LA Times went crazy, everything, New York Times went crazy, everybody all over the country because they had scored so high, and they were just revered for their ability to have taken this examination. They, they never had had it at Garfield. And, uh, and of course, inner city kids were not really known to be able to comprehend and to be able to really accomplish that kind of thought process. Two months later, uh, they were called cheaters. And all of the all of the, the things that we had read about in the early time New York everybody now turned completely on the other side and they got more publicity for being cheaters. And so that was it. And uh, uh, Tom Muska and uh, and Ramon Menendez, who were the producers and the writers of the script, and, and this uh, uh, actually directed the script and uh, they came 
change any and said we have the opportunity of trying to get this piece of work and we'd love for you to play I'm in. and I said uh, you know, yeah Lou this was your second film right right after La Bamba yep. okay. <laughs> But I won't say that Santa Diller came out before the Mamba. <laughs> yeah, uh, what, what, what happened is, is I, I made the Mamba. It, it took, you know, forever to come out. Uh, I was out of money. I, I was out of money. I, I was oh, you stayed at my house. Yeah, I, yes, I, yeah, exactly. You know, I slept on another friend's couch while I was making the movie. Uh, uh, and, you know, I got paid scale. So, so shot that in June of 86 and, you know, come... Uh, Come December, man, I'm, I'm almost out of money. And then I, thank goodness, landed a gig uh, on Miami Vice, which paid me as much as Obama did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had one scene with, with Eddie. And after we did the scene, and Eddie, Ed, Eddie and I, we had Luis Valdez and Danny Valdez in common, Drew Zoot Suit and everything else. And Eddie was familiar with all that. He knew that it was in the cans. Uh, and we did one scene together. I'll never forget this. And, and he literally goes, what are you doing next month? <laughs> this is what you have. I'm, I'm free. You want to do lunch? <laughs> uh, he says, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing this really important film. It's a very important film. You have to be a part of it. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and, he gives me a, and he gives me a phone number to call when I get back to Los Angeles because they actually shot Miami Vice in Miami. Imagine that. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I get back to this moment. Ramona and this is under the director, and I went in immediately and met with Tom Musk and Ramona. That's how I got into the film. Yeah, it was all, all this guy. Yeah. Did you ever get a chance to see him? 
performed on Broadway? No. What? No, I didn't. That's so interesting. What would you say, because when you watch this film, what I love about the character of Kim McAfee as played by you, is that there's an innocence to her, but she's no pushover. <laughs> you know, she's really got these two different sides to her. Was that a challenge to play, or was it particularly fun to play? Oh, dear. Well, there's this... There's me, like right now, and then there's another side of me. Uh, where... I got the music in there. I got the music in there. I've seen Tommy. <laughs> so much about, about uh, uh, movies and actors and actresses, wow, and directors and everything. It's so great to be in front of you guys. We love you! Um, if, if I had to pick maybe a, a favorite, a kind of standout moment from Bye Bye Birdie, it's probably got a lot of living to do. And I just mesmerized by your dancing in that sequence. And now, is, just curiosity, is anyone going to see Bye Bye Birdie for the first time right now? No shame if, if the answer is yes. Not many, not many. Right, that's really not a surprise. Um, what, what was that scene like for you to do with all, with all those great dance moves? Was that a, uh, a challenge to learn them all, or did you already have them in your skill set and repertoire? Well, I mean, oops, sorry. used to be microphone. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, we did we did that number in, in three weeks and it was Ona White and she at the time had broken her leg so she was sitting you know like this uh, you know choreographing the whole thing and uh, Hanson I remember Hanson he uh, he was the one that she was up showing me all the stuff. I had a great time. Just a fantastic time. We can tell what we want. Oh, good. So, good. in the way that Kim is just a huge fan of Conrad Birdie, who was that person for you at the time? Who, who were you having your heels over at that time? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had not met him. I, uh, but the next movie that I did was Viva Las Vegas. It just was so strange. Uh, and I just met him right before we started doing Viva Las Vegas. Yeah. I would love to know what he thought of Conrad Birdie. Did he get the joke? I, well, he was, uh, he had such a great sense of humor. He, he went with the flow. He, he was, he was great. He was great. I love it. There's so many priceless performances in this film. I mean, Paul Lind. <gasps> Scenes. 
what was going through your mind when you heard they wanted to create these fabulous bookends with you? Oh, bless you. <laughs> uh, it, it was Mr. Sidney's idea, and I had tremendous respect and admiration for him. All of his ideas. Uh, um, my goodness, it's so many things. Uh, so many things have happened. I see you. I see you. I was being very stealth. But did you? Did you? Feel, I know this is 60 years ago. I don't expect you to remember everything. But did you feel like more pressure on the day that you shot those two sequences, the beginning sequence and the end sequence, because they were so important to the film? Well, it was three or four months after the film had uh, finished shooting. And uh, I had gone down to my original brunette color, oh. which is not now. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to go up again to redhead. Uh, <laughs> But it was all exciting. Uh, it was all really exciting. And I knew Mr. Sidney knew what he was doing. Uh, it had never been done before. But his mind, you know, he always had th these great ideas. It shows. So, listen, before we watch the movie, you and I have something in common. We are both April babies. <laughs> so my, my birthday was last week, but it's not about me. Your birthday is coming up at the end of the month. You may or may not know this, but Turner Classic Movies has a sister TV channel, which is the Food Network. Okay. So we enlisted Sherry Yard, who is one of the stars of the Great American Baking Show, and also the person who bakes all the chocolate Oscars oh, every year at the Governor's Ball. And she was so inspired by you and your legs in this movie that we have a little something to surprise you with. So I hope you will all join me in a little song that goes like, Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Anne Margaret. Here, I'll take the mic. <laughs> I always make the same wish. I always make the same wish. But, uh, Happy birthday and thank you, Anne Margaret. We sent Julia a script and I wrote a note saying, I hear you get 20 a picture now and it was a t we sent her a $20 bill. <laughs>